So this week I was lucky enough to have the time to do a little extra research and reading on the lessons, really kind of digging into the perspective of them and in context of the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And I wanted to share some of that. I find it really interesting. And so I thought you might also get, enjoy hearing a little bit of context um, about this week's, particularly the Gospel lesson. So as we know, this is from Matthew, and um, this is the third of three questions that the leaders in the temple ask of Jesus. Um, the first was asked, um, it was the question about um, the coin, who should basically get paid the tax? And um, the uh, they were trying to trip Jesus up with that question in that um, they were going to try to find out, does Jesus think... He is the Messiah who's come to um, be God's messenger here on earth, or is he just thinking that he is another person of power who should overthrow the empire and um, other systems of authority so that he was the one in charge? And of course, the people in the temple were part of the ones who had that power, so they were not super psyched about that option. So they show him the coin, and Jesus, of course, says, well, whose picture is on the coin? And they answer Caesar's, and so Jesus' response is, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's, which, you know, we know means, like, we need to focus on the things that are not necessarily about this earthly life, but really putting our sights on the new Jerusalem, what's to come and what that's about. Um, and so then the Sadducees asked the question next, and their question was basically the one about the widow who kept marrying the brothers and each brother died, and so when she goes to heaven, with whom will she be paired? Like, who will be her husband in heaven? There were no children. And... Um, I thought, man, these guys, like, really, like, it was like a game show, right? Like, stump Jesus. Um, anyway, and so the response from Jesus was, that's about, you know, it basically was the same answer. That's about this world. Like, heaven is not worried about who was married to whom and what the rules are and how you're supposed to be doing the things that matter here on earth. Heaven is about love and being connected to God and a much bigger picture about, you know, about which these things just really don't matter. And so third question, and this is happening on the Tuesday of Holy Week. So this is sort of their last ditch attempt to, you know, trip up Jesus in order to charge him um, with treason and other things, because he is upending the status quo, which does not make those with power very happy. And so this last question is um, basically that question about what is the best, you know, what is the most important commandment? And there were 613 commandments. So this was a bit of a loaded question. You know, um, many, many rules about right living and how to move through the world and all of the different things which we've heard throughout um, Scripture. And Jesus' response is very outside the box in which he talks about, he re references the Shema, which is the daily prayer that um, those of Jewish descent, Jews, always recite about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, um, with all that you are. And then he pairs it with what we heard from Leviticus, and that is, and love that your neighbor as yourself. And he says, everything rests on this, these two things, and um, all of our laws and all of our agreements and everything boils down to love. Love and relationship, I think. And so, once again, they didn't trip him up, and then he asks them a question about David and, you know, how the Messiah is to be known. And um, they get a little bit confused and are not sure what the answer is like. And one of the things that I was reading was, you know, this is Matthew's gospel really works hard to establish Jesus's authority and lineage. So if you remember, the gospel of Matthew begins with this whole like chronology, genealogy of lineage to show that Jesus really was tied to the house of David 
and is a descendant of that. And so um, this is kind of that bookend of that, where Jesus basically points out, look, I am who the people are saying that I am. And, you know, three days later, Jesus dies on the cross for us. And so um, I think, you know, this idea of, and they didn't ask him any more questions. That's one piece in this gospel I do not love because I do feel like one of the things we learn from Jesus, which I appreciate, he asks more questions than he gives answers. And I think we're served really well by our curiosity, by our wondering, by our noticing. And um, I, for one, am somebody who loves to ask questions. In fact, if you talk to Dennis, he will say, I'm not able to ask any fewer than three questions in a row. So if I ask two, he often will just wait to hear what the third question is going to be. But I just like to know. I like to try to figure out how things are working. I'm curious. I always loved it when my kids or other children are asking questions because it's just such an engaging way to be in the world, to be curious and to wonder about things. That's what our whole godly play, you know, youth formation system is about. It's about, I wonder, I wonder this, I wonder that. Um, and so it puzzles me that, you know, they actually say he doesn't ask any, they did not ask him any other questions. What I read in that subtext, and this is totally my interpretation, is they gave up. Like, they were no longer curious. They made up their minds. And that's one of the problems with not asking questions. When we absolutely stick our feet in and dig in, we quit being curious. Whether it's about a group of people or about a system or a structure or a way of doing things, when we no longer are curious about it, we get stuck. And one of the things we know is creation is constantly evolving, right? Nothing stays the same. As we just saw, like, what was it, two days ago? It was gorgeous, and I was, like, hot outside, and now we have a foot of snow on the ground. I mean, and it's not always comfortable, too, right? Change is challenging to us, and not being certain is hard for us. And I think that's part of that call about being in relationship with God is trusting that God is in all of the things with us, but also in being in relationship with each other, that when we love each other, being curious and trusting that the other person is probably doing the best that they can to offer love to the world or to connect or reach out. Not everyone, because there are some who, for whatever reason, choose to get stuck, and they're not interested in changing or growing or owning their pieces. Most of us, though, are really trying to do our best, and if we remain curious, it's one of the best signs for staying in relationship with each other, because we keep growing together as opposed to growing in opposite directions. When we ask questions of one another, even when we're asking questions of God, I don't think that makes God mad. I think, again, this is my personal editorial. I don't know for sure. But I do think that that's just part of being in relationship. And so when we're even saying, like, why, God, why this? Um, or how can that happen? When we look at places in the world where we're seeing violence, like Gaza and the Holy Land right now, or the war in Ukraine, or we have gun violence where too many people are dying, um, it's easy to be like, why, God? But I think a lot of that is because we are forgetting to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. We are forgetting that we're all interconnected in this web of life, that one thing happens in creation and the ripples of that go out. So the good news of that is it also means we have the ability to be those pebbles, right, that send the ripples out over across life. We don't know how our actions may influence other things and I don't need to worry about if what I'm doing right now in this moment is actually going to solve and create peace in the Holy Land, right? But what I can do is think about what am I doing to bring and be peace here in this place or in my home or even in my own heart as I try to love myself. Sometimes 
I don't know about you, but I am the meanest to myself than I am to anyone else. You know, I make a mistake and I'm so mean to myself. Or I look in the mirror and I say really mean things that I would never say to somebody else. And so I think that's part of that piece too, is remembering like we are all created in God's image and we are all here for a divine purpose to be ourselves and to show up for the world and each other, to be in relationship with which also means good relationship with ourselves. So I'm kind of going off onto all of these tangents, but I hope what you might be able to take away with you today as you move through this week is to notice where are you seeing God, loving God or loving your neighbor or loving yourself in your own life this week? And where might you offer that to the world? In our session um, between the services, the mental health session, one of the things that the panelists offered was, you know, naming to our neighbors when we notice something might be going on with them. Not being afraid to have that courageous conversation just in saying, you know, I haven't been seeing you around. Are you okay? Or you just... Seemed, you seem a little off, or you're very quiet, and I just want to check in. Are you all right? And then also being willing to have the courageous conversation to say to other people, you know what, I'm having a really hard time, and I'm wondering, would you be willing to go on a walk with me, or go out to coffee with me, or would you just be willing to pray for me? And offering and being open to that idea of relationship, because that's where God is. We don't get to know God in um, such a tangible way in this life. And so we find God in each other and in creation and the world. And every chance we take to live into those commandments are really rich opportunities for those ripples, not only to flow out into the world, but also to flow and fill our hearts. Amen.